Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Jason Williams, and I am coming to you from the DNLC live channel. And uh, this is the first in a three part series on RNA seq for uh, with DNA subway, one of the tools that we built here. So to get started and welcome you, I just have a couple of slides, which I'm going to start sharing now. Okay, let's take a look at that. Okay, awesome. So uh, as I mentioned, I'm on the DNA Learning Center live channel and this is an experiment. We really welcome your feedback. So let us know what you'd like to see, uh, how you enjoy the programming that we've put out. And uh, the purpose of our channel is to provide a whole bunch of resources for learning in genetics, molecular biology, bioinformatics. And we have really a range of lab and computer demos, online courses, and it's all tailored for high school, middle school, general public, in this case, undergraduates. Uh, so please uh, go ahead and make sure that you uh, visit our website at dnalc.cshl.edu and you'll find all of our live content and programming and the schedule and everything like that. Also be sure to like uh, this particular video and also subscribe and follow us on the variety of social media platforms that we have there for you, whatever you like. Uh, please follow us so that you get the latest updates and also let us know how we're doing. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm at the DNA Learning Center, which is uh, one of several, uh, well, there's a physical building, which I'm not at currently, um, but it's uh, based at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and it's really uh, a, a program that has had uh, national and international influences in a lot of areas in biology teaching. And Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, of course, is world famous uh, for its research in molecular biology genetics. So just a little context in case you're watching and you aren't familiar with what Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, the DNA Learning Center is. Okay, so now to this uh, first episode, and this is episode one uh, or part one of three parts on RNA-seq uh, using the DNA subway tool. So who's this course for? Um, I think that this course is really uh, geared for folks who are at the undergraduate biology level, uh, a little bit past intro, so 200 level and up. Now, if you have completed AP Bio or if you're really enthusiastic about biology, uh, hopefully I think you'll get something out of the course. Um, but certainly if you have a little bit more background, there may be some parts for you uh, that uh, you, you actually understand a little bit better because you have that background. Uh, the format is going to be three sessions, so I've broken this up into three sessions. They're approximately 45 to 60 minutes each, and um, it is uh, a, a longish YouTube video, but I hope that you'll go ahead and watch at your own pace. There are also some um, uh, slides and resources and worksheets that you can follow at the DNA Learning Center live site, so look for this page. Maybe I'll visit there later just to make sure you get it, and you can actually follow along with everything I'm doing using our DNA Subway tool. The course uh, has several goals. We're not going to do all of those today. Uh, that's why it's three parts. Uh, one, we're going to just talk about what is an RNA-seq experiment. It's a really useful and popular experiment. Uh, so we want to understand a little bit about the experiment and its design. Uh, we want to understand the very first part of how DNA sequence is generated and how um, generating high quality sequence is going to allow us to do the RNA-seq experiment. Uh, and then we're going to use fat, uh, DNA Subway with a variety of tools. And we have a very straightforward uh, and very powerful RNA-seq analysis uh, software that we're using. There are many, many different types of RNA-seq uh, software. Uh, and so you can go ahead and uh, choose your pick, but we're going to be sticking with these. I'll also mention that I see people uh, in the chat. So this is happening live. I see Pascal saying hello. So if you do have questions, uh, let, let us know in the chat. I'll try to answer those. And there's also a moderator who can help with questions if needed. Um, if you do want to follow along using DNA Subway, you can go ahead and get a free account at cybers.org. And for the green line, uh, which, we're, which is the workflow that we're going to be using, uh, you must have a DNA Subway account. It's not optional, uh, as in the previous video. So go ahead and sign up for that uh, so that you can go ahead and use the uh, full range of tools that are there. Okay, so RNA-seq with DNA Subway, background and sequence quality is where we're starting at. 
This today's episode is the introduction. We'll talk about the example data set that we're using. We'll learn a little bit about where those data came from, and then we'll actually do a part of the lab when we're going to examine the sequence quality. Uh, in the introduction, uh, first, I need to say that what is RNA-seq? So that's the first question that we need to answer, especially if you've never heard of it before. Uh, so RNA-seq is uh, measuring the transcriptome, and we'll talk about what that means. Uh, really, to understand uh, the goal of an RNA-seq experiment is to understand what genes are active and under what circumstances. In order to know that, we have to know, are those genes actually being transcribed, usually into messenger RNA? Um, so, for example, you know, if you think about a cell in the liver, a cell that's in the liver has the exact same DNA instructions as a neuron, right, in the brain. Uh, what makes those two cells different is that the genes being expressed differ greatly between those cells. So this is a really key concept. If you just look at the DNA from cell to cell, let's say in a eukaryotic uh, multicellular organism, there's not really gonna be a difference. Every cell has the same DNA. So you need to actually figure out, well, what are the genes that are being actually read and transcribed? So RNA-seq is what allows us to measure the transcriptome. And uh, if you've never heard of that word, maybe hopefully you've heard of the word genome, which is the sum of all of our genes. So the transcriptome is the sum of all of our transcripts. All of the transcription, the gene transcription that's occurring in a cell, or tissue, and I mentioned that way, and sometimes I'm gonna use both of those things. There are methods which allow you to do single cell RNA-seq. So you're looking at one single individual cell, uh, but very often we're looking at uh, entire tissues or entire organs um, when we're doing this experiment. And we use the abundance of RNA transcript as a proxy for the activity of some cellular process, whether that's protein synthesis or whether that's regulatory activity. So a key message, and I'm gonna come back to sharing, but I'm just gonna zoom in for myself so that you're looking at me uh, and I can kind of give you a little bit of a, an emphasis here. Uh, when we're doing RNA-seq, there are a lot of assumptions that go into the experiment and it's, um, I'm gonna try to present it in a straightforward way, but just be considerate that there's a little bit of nuance we are gonna measure, hopefully uh, in our RNA-seq experiment, how much transcript is present. But um, that doesn't mean um, that, you know, for example, that that transcript uh, will necessarily mean that there's more protein or that there's less protein. We infer that, we're probably usually gonna be correct, but there are all other sorts of caveats and nuance. So for example, if you have uh, an mRNA message uh, that's really, really abundant, um, but maybe the protein that it produces is uh, very, very, uh, has a very short uh, or high turnover, and so you don't actually get all that much protein. Or maybe you have a very small amount of transcript, but yet the protein is very stable, and so it has a high activity, uh, even though um, the, the number of transcripts are low. So keep in mind that we're measuring not directly transcription, but abundance and the amount of mRNA. And that's a good proxy, but it's just a, just a nuance. Okay, so back to sharing that. Just wanted to stop there just to emphasize that. Okay, um, and typically in an RNA-seq experiment, we analyze these data uh, by comparing samples. So we might have a, a setup when we're looking at cells that have cancer versus cells that don't have cancer. Or we might be looking at a developmental time point, you know, um, let's say two days post-fertilization for let's say an embryo or almost an embryo, not yet a blast blastocyst or whatever. Uh, and we might be looking at a time point later. Uh, so those are examples of the, connect, of the types of uh, uh, setups we might have. So here is the broadest overview uh, that I could possibly give, I think, of what an RNA-seq experiment, how it might be laid out, or what are some of the major steps. At the very first step, um, you need to have something to compare. So let's assume, and, I'm, and this time I'm, I'm often going to be talking about mice, um, we have a control group. Uh, which doesn't receive a treatment or is a whatever, for whatever reason we're calling it control. And then we have an experimental group. So imagine that an experimental group 
uh, we've treated the mouse with a drug. And we're assuming that that drug is going to affect gene expression in some way as the, uh, as the organism reacts to it. So that's step one, you need to design, and that's, I'm going to go a little bit into that at some point because it's very important, um, but you need to have an experiment that you want to test. Once you have that, then the second phase is actually extracting RNA from that, that organism. And that's not trivial. RNA is hard to work with in the laboratory. Um, unlike DNA, which is very stable, RNA is not stable at all. And in fact, uh, most of the time you have... Um, RNAs is all over your skin. They're all over the environment. Uh, so it's very easy for your RNA to be degraded in the RNA-seq experiment. So you actually um, have a pretty, um, uh, a pretty sophisticated, is, might be the right word, uh, setup for extracting RNA and then verifying that the RNA is high quality. And then once you have that RNA, there's a whole bunch of steps, which I'll go into later in, the, um, in this presentation, on making what we call a sequencing library. So you prepare the RNA in order to be sequenced. Uh, a, a spoiler is that you actually are turning the RNA into DNA, which is a lot more stable, easy to work with, and easy to sequence. So in that third step, we're actually going to go ahead and sequence. Uh, and by sequencing that, we are uh, generating millions and millions of reads. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later, but we're generating short fragments of uh, this RNA message, which is now DNA, that we're going to use uh, and actually count. And then finally, to do that counting and to do that analysis, you end up needing to use uh, quite a bit of uh, computational power and hence the bioinformatics. So we're mostly going to be talking about uh, working with uh, step four here, but we do need to understand something about all the other steps that come before that. Okay, um, so what can expression tell you? Well, here is a nice uh, little example of that. In fact, uh, although this is not necessarily an RNA-seq experiment, it basically uh, looks just like one because this is what you might expect to see. Uh, if you're familiar with electrophoresis, then we're actually looking in column uh, or in uh, row A and B, we're looking at the amount of protein uh, that's been expressed in these two uh, really gels. So we're looking at a gene, uh, there's CYP1A and CYP1B. So these are cytochromes, uh, they're, they're in the P450 family, which is a family of genes that's pretty, um, I say, uh, well known, uh, involved in metabolism of uh, drugs, including toxins. So if you take an aspirin or if you take uh, any type of uh, medication, uh, lots of them are uh, going to be metabolized by this uh, P450 or uh, something in that family. And in this case, you're looking at uh, the response or the amount of this gene being expressed in people who did not smoke or never smoked before in their lives and people who are regular smokers. And what I hope you get from looking at this gel, if you look at the gel on the top, um, you see on the left-hand side that those bands are very faint. So in other words, those genes are not very activated. There's not very much of this protein. But in people who smoke, this protein, why well, there's a lot more. And that's likely because the cell is producing more of those um, en enzymes in order to help metabolize toxins that are created. And if you look at the bottom with this in section B here, in this figure, again, you're getting the idea that the amount of protein uh, that you see, and therefore um, somewhere along the line, perhaps the, the amount of mRNA that you see is much greater in smokers than never smokers. And this is exactly the type of thing that you want to get as a conclusion from an RNA-seq experiment. You want to hopefully find out that a gene that you're looking for is really highly expressed or uh, when ordinarily it wasn't as highly expressed if you uh, look at the experimental versus the control, or maybe even the opposite, maybe in the experiment versus the control group, a gene that used to be highly expressed is now not expressed at a very high amount, maybe not at all. Uh, it also is interesting too, because this one uh, definitely is gene expression. You could see um, this particular gene uh, on the bottom, it may be hard to read, but these are various tissues like whole blood or monocytes or different uh, tissues in the, in the body. Uh, and then the lung is the only one where you see this really, really high bar graph. And that's because it happens to be that these CYP1A and 1B genes are 
highly expressed in lung and mucosa. So again, relating back to the example being about smoking, it makes sense that these genes are expressed there. Uh, so gene expression can tell you a lot. Um, another, uh, so that's what we want to get out of it, but also there's another concept, a key concept, really key concept that you need to understand if you're doing an RNA-seq experiment. And that's the idea of variance or variation versus difference. So uh, in an RNA-seq experiment, we need to find the true, I put that in quotes, the true differences between samples and we have to ignore, or I wrote here, we have to subtract trivial differences. So differences that really don't matter very much. So maybe you've seen a, a child's uh, you know, book like this. Uh, maybe anybody can have fun looking at that called Spot the Difference. And you're supposed to look at the photo or the drawing on the left and look at the one on the right and see where are they different. Now, obviously they're mostly the same, right? Um, but if you look carefully, so, uh, hopefully I'm not spoiling this for you, but right over here, there's no tree in the background on that little island back there. And over there, there is a tree. And the number of these uh, colored plants in the foreground are different over here. There's a little look at daisy or something. So spotting the difference, right, is uh, one of the key things you're doing in an RNA-seq experiment, except that usually most RNA-seq experiments are not going to be that straightforward. Uh, this is a stereogram of two star fields looking at the night. And uh, with the stereogram, theoretically, if you really squint your face and sort of look at these uh, side by side, I believe there is one star that's different. And I think this is a little bit, um, you know, that's either there or not there. I think that this is a little bit more like an RNA-seq experiment. The idea being that in an RNA-seq experiment, um, you know, look, for a human, there are thousands of genes uh, and even more transcripts if you want to count every isoform, which is a form of a, of a transcript or form of a gene. And so figuring out where those differences are amongst, you know, it's sort of a needle in a haystack uh, project requires uh, uh, quite a bit of effort, but we can do it, uh, but it requires some effort. So it's not always obvious. Uh, one of the things that makes it not obvious is this concept called biological variation. And I'm certainly not opposed to dwelling on this slide for a little while, but I have a question for you. Which of these is a chocolate cake? So this is not a trick question. Um, I'm thinking about the store now and actually going and getting a chocolate cake, but which of these is chocolate cake? Well, they all are chocolate cake, right? Uh, but they're all different, aren't they, right? Um, nevertheless, even though maybe the frosting design, I'm sure the recipes might be slightly different, um, they're all chocolate cake. And so the problem is when we're thinking about uh, looking to say between a control group and an experimental group of organisms, if we're actually asking the question, what's different between them? Well, there's gonna be a lot of differences, right? If I uh, have a, a hundred humans, let's say I'm doing a clinical study or a clinical trial, um, and I wanna know whether a drug has an effect. There are many, many differences between all of those individuals. They're all humans, but in addition to any effect or any difference that might be due to the impact of a drug, there are also gonna be a whole host of differences that are just, uh, in this case, trivial um, because they're not related to the drug. They're just differences between organisms. And so this is another thing that we have to deal with in doing an rna seq experiment. We need to be able to uh, ignore the variation that doesn't matter. Um, so even though these are all looking different, slightly different recipes, we would probably eat them all because they're all chocolate cake. So that's great. Uh, here is a more biological example. So height is probably something that you're used to appreciating in variants. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, women uh, typically in uh, the human species typically have a little bit lower height uh, than men. Men tend to be taller. So that's a sexual, sexually dimorphic characteristic in human beings. But uh, the other thing, and this is gonna be more important as we go along, is that we need to understand that in statistics, we can map out those differences, we can understand them as what we call a distribution. And that'll be even more important in probably our final episode, where we do need to talk about statistics a little bit. So here uh, in this curve that's labeled in this sort of pink color, uh, you have women. Uh, the, the top of the peak here is the height 
that's the most common. So somewhere around between 160, 165 uh, centimeters in this case, that's where most of the population um, of women might find the average height. And if you look for men, it's out here maybe towards 180. Nevertheless, if I were to ask you, if I were to ask you um, to guess what sex, biological sex a person was based on their height, um, it, it could be difficult if I only gave you the height of that, you know, if a, a, that person. If I told you that the height of that person was 162 centimeters, well, you probably would make a better than chance guess at that being a woman. But if you look here at this blue area under the curve, there's still a pretty good significant uh, number of men that will also have that same height. It's lower than for women, so it's a less of a chance, but it's, it's true. What about if I told you, this is even worse, that the height of an individual is 178 centimeters. There's quite a number of women that are out there uh, that are as tall as the average man is. And so in the RNA-seq experiment, what we're trying to do is if you imagine instead of this saying woman versus man, let's say this is gene expression, and let's say that we're talking about the difference between uh, no drug and drug, um, we have to be able to tease apart whether the difference is so great that we're really saying the drug has a real effect or whether the difference is not great enough and then we uh, get confused. We'll talk more about variation later, but it's something that we have to cope with in our experiment. The other type of difference is not biological difference. It's something called, or bi biological variation, it's something called experimental variation. Um, there are a lot of ways to control this, so it's a little bit less of an impact on our experiment. But um, this is something, if you're not familiar with it, I hope to get you a little bit more familiar in a moment. Uh, this is looking at the signal in a sequencing run. Uh, we have Gs, As, Cs, and, G and Ts. Um, when we're measuring that, there's a chance when we do our sequencing experiment that because of the machine that we're using or because let's say that we ran samples, um, which is a common thing that can happen, it's called a batch effect. Let's say that we prepared our experiment on Tuesday and Sally did Tuesday's experiment and then Megan did uh, Wednesday's experiment and then Joe did Thursday's experiment. Um, is there a chance that because of the way the experimenter or the machine that they use or the pipetter that they used, is there a chance that they um, did things slightly differently and therefore um, the difference in samples is not because there's a real biological difference or because there's a real effect from let's say a drug, but there's a difference just because of the way the experiment was done and that's a real effect. Um, so often what we do in order to counteract that is we do multiple replicates, and this is a key thing to do. So we'll sample from many, many different animals to hopefully rid ourselves of the biological variation or to make the, the, the hopeful, of, well, let's say to make the difference between the control and the experiment stand out. And we'll also um, think about whether we need technical replicates. Uh, uh, before I go on to the introduction to our data set, there's a question in the chat which is how to control gene expression. You might need to elaborate on what your question is, but I can try to answer it just a little bit. Um, so gene expression uh, is a really, really complex topic. Uh, your cells uh, not only contain the machinery in order to make um, you know, proteins, but they also contain uh, other proteins that affect whether a gene is gonna be turned on or turned off. Sometimes that can be affecting whether the gene is able to be read from the DNA. Sometimes that could mean whether uh, the, the uh, product, the mRNA or the protein is gonna be degraded more quickly. So there are lots of different things that could affect what controls gene expression. Uh, and the question that was elaborated in a lab, the way that we might control gene expression uh, as a moderator has suggested is if we do genetic engineering, we can put certain pieces or sequences in front of the DNA sequence that might um, enhance its ability to be expressed or increase the amount of expression. We might also treat with drugs uh, that may affect gene expression. Uh, so there's different ways that we might be able to affect it in the lab. Uh, and then we can measure it using RNA-seq.
Okay, so hopefully that helps. I'm going to go back to our slides here because we've got to keep going and also get to our experiment. Okay, so what are we going to be looking at today in our uh, experiment on uh, RNA-seq? Okay, so what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be doing an RNA-seq analysis using these uh, neural progenitor stem cells. So we're going to be working on these human stem cells that exist in the brain. Uh, there is a drawing of them. Those, because they're stem cells, they can, they're not differentiated. They can differentiate into neurons, or they might become another population of cells like astrocytes, glia, or little oligodendrocytes, so different types of neurons. But um, we're going to, we're going to look at these uh, cells after they have been infected by the Zika virus. So uh, I think you probably have heard of Zika uh, before. It was in the news, certainly, um, in the last few years. Um, it's a very, you know, terrible thing because uh, in the case of Zika virus, it doesn't necessarily make you all that sick in many cases, um, but for pregnant uh, mothers, it can be extremely damaging because uh, these, uh, the Zika virus attacks these, uh, among other things, these neural stem cells, and it can lead to severe birth defects where the brain is not properly formed. So um, this paper, actually, uh, let me go back to it one second. We're working uh, to analyze the same data that this paper analyzed. So this is provided in the resources that's linked to my page on DNLC Live. So if you want to download and read the paper, you can get even more. Um, and you can follow along that way. And then there's another paper which generated the data for the paper that we're using. Um, and this group generated that data. And like I said, they found that it infects human embryonic cortical neural cells. So this is more important uh, for uh, children or for you know, embryos that are forming. Um, the infected cells produce viral particles and that leads to the death of these stem cells. So uh, basically you don't have um, the amount of stem cells that you need to continue forming the brain. It also uh, has some other uh, deleterious effects. Now, what we're looking at um, may take a second to interpret. I'm going to try to show you just a little bit of it, but um, we have some samples, and in a lot of time in science, we'll use the word mock to mean uh, control. So we have some samples of stem cells uh, that are not infected. So those are anything labeled mock is not infected. And usually if we say 1-1 one -one and 1-2, uh, that means that this is the uh, one group of control and we have replicated it at least two times. Um, then the Zeke V1 and V2, these are, uh, these are data from uh, cells or, or sequence from cells where we have infected them in a Petri dish with the Zika virus. So the succession number is that these are stored on a website called uh, NCBI uh, Sequence Read Archive. Uh, we'll talk some more about some of these other things here. They don't matter so much to us right this second. Probably next episode, they'll matter a little bit more. Um, but maybe you can draw your attention to the number of reads. So we generate from each of those samples several million uh, DNA sequencing reads from each one of them. So in this case, we've got something like 15 million sequence reads, and we'll talk about sequencing in just a moment. Um, the sequence read archive is the place where we uh, got these files. Uh, maybe we can take a look at it. I don't know about this episode, we can take a look. Right now, it says there's about, uh, since I just pulled this uh, the other day, about 40 quadrillion uh, nucleotides of DNA sequence. So really just about every uh, high throughput sequencing experiment uh, deposits their data here so that other scientists can use and benefit. And this is all made possible by the fact that over the last few years, the cost of doing, doing DNA sequencing has dramatically um, decreased. So let's say in 2000, um, you know, 20 years ago, uh, to do a thousand base pairs of sequence would cost $10,000, right? Um, but really it dropped starting in 2007, 2008 to the point where that's uh, basically, you know, uh, a penny to get that much sequence data. That's why, in a fact, um, we're living in the era of um, pandemics and COVID-19 
uh, why people are able to respond is because we can we can sequence things a lot quicker, and then we can put those data where where scientists can access it much quicker. Okay, so how do we generate that sequence data? Um, the first thing we need to do, and I mentioned this a few slides back, is we generate something called a library. Uh, and it's called a library because you could think of in this analogy as each one of these books as being a record of all of the transcripts that are present within the cell. So when we make a cDNA, cDNA library, which is what I'm going to talk to you about in a second, um, what we mean is that in a little tube that we're holding that contains this DNA, we have hopefully a copy of all of the genes or all of the mRNAs that are present. Uh, and so we think of it as a library. We can keep coming back to that tube and taking a look. Um, in one sense, we're, we're really even looking at which books are on off the sh shelf and being actively read. Uh, so it's just a it's just a word, just a term. Um, but maybe you'll get a little bit of a sense of it as we keep going along. So here's what happens um, once we, let's say, have our neural stem cells in this case. We need to extract the RNA. And so we lyse the cells or break them open. And once we break them open, what we're going to do is a process called cDNA synthesis. We're turning the RNA into DNA. And the C here stands for complementary, complementary uh, DNA. And the way that that happens <clears throat> is that we add to a tube uh, some primers. Usually we add a bunch of what we call oligo uh, DTs, which are just long sequences of Ts. And, <clears throat> pardon me, if you remember your molecular biology, you may remember that when an mRNA mes uh, messenger RNA is made, typically it, it ends with a long sequence of As. Uh, that's called polyadenylation. And so the last step in forming a messenger RNA is that it gets polyadenylated and then usually uh, it is uh, sent out of the nucleus in order to be transcribed on the ribosome. So most as a messenger RNA, at least in eukaryotes um, and in animals, this is not true of every organism or every organelle, um, gets polyadenylated. And we add an enzyme, a reverse transcriptase, to sequence or to rather synthesize a strand of DNA. And we actually end up with a hybrid or a complex of an RNA strand and a DNA strand. Um, so that uh, we then have a, a different set of primers, hexamers, uh, that randomly go ahead and prime that RNA, which you could see becomes a poly U once you do that uh, first round. Uh, we treat it with RNA. RNAs to get rid of the RNA strand, and we end up with uh, this cDNA strand, which is just DNA. Now, I have gone really quickly through this, and I don't think I've given a very thorough explanation. Uh, for the sake of time, I can't afford to give a thorough explanation of cDNA th synthesis, but if you go to our website, I've put some resources there, and if you look it up, if you didn't get that, then really the, the key conclusion is just to know that we have this molecular technique to transform RNA that we get from the cells into DNA. And again, the reason for doing that is because the DNA is much more stable and it's also easier to work with and to sequence. Now, the next thing we do is sequencing, and I'm referring here to a technology called Illumina sequencing. Um, this is known by many different names, unfortunately. So Illumina is a company, so it's kind of like saying if I want to make a copy, I'm making a Xerox. Uh, but we are talking about Illumina sequencing, and um, it's this form of sequencing that relies on chopping up the, D the DNA, as you see here, into short fragments. And those fragments are usually somewhere on the order of a few hundred base pairs. And from that, we, after we chop it up, you can use um, different methods to do that. We often need to add to it little adapter pieces of DNA. Um, and those adapters can have everything from barcodes, which allow us to identify uh, individual transcripts or perhaps identify um, pooled samples. And those transcripts also are important in this technology because we end up taking these uh, short pieces of DNA and binding them to a glass slide, which you're going to see in my next step. 
So what happens on uh, step B here, and this is all taken from Illumina's website. So I've also in the slides given, or in the resource page, given a link to uh, some nice videos that go through this. What happens is that on this glass slide, we have complementary pieces of DNA that bind a piece of one of these fragments. And um, with each one of these fragments, uh, the goal is to get them on the glass slide, hopefully not too close to one another. And then, whoops, we undergo a process that's kind of like PCR, where we actually copy those uh, fragments. And the idea of copying them is to end up with these little clusters. So in, in this uh, labeled unit here, one, two, three, and four, each one of these clusters of DNA on our glass slide, the cool thing about them is that they're clones that every DNA sequence in cluster one is the same, every DNA sequence in cluster two is the same, and so on and so forth. So we get these clusters. And then from that, what we do is we start another process of sequencing. And in that process, what we do is we go ahead and replicate that DNA, except this time we have uh, basically um, this modification where we get each cluster to release a little bit of light. Uh, and this was, I'm gonna jump all the way back. This, this was, let's go back to a different slide here where I showed you something that now has more significance. What this does with those clusters is gives you these sort of little photos. Um, so this G, A, T, and C, these are actually, literally it's a camera that takes a picture of that glass slide and zooms in literally um, like a microscope on the glass slide and finds out what the color of any one of those clusters are. And since this happens uh, in cycles, uh, every time you take a photo, every round of sequencing, um, this pattern changes. And if you know that a cluster is lighting up G uh, uh, on the first round of sequencing, then you know that the sequence number, the nucleotide number one is a G, a nucleotide number two, uh, maybe once you go to the second cycle is a C or so on and so forth. Uh, again, I am not giving you, unfortunately, um, the best possible explanation of, of this. The reason why is because uh, just for sake of time, it's not my focus. Let's go back to sharing here. Okay. Um, the reason why I'm not giving that explanation is just for sake of time, but go ahead and check out, check out the videos because uh, it's really pretty cool. What you generate from that is the DNA sequence uh, data. All right. So, um, you end up with you know your DNA sequencing reads uh, from that process. So it's a cool it's a cool uh, technology. Um, before I go on to that, I see some questions in the chat. Uh, RNA sequencing helps us to understand about new viruses and also about dinosaurs. Okay, those are two very different topics. Uh, so for viruses, yes, uh, all of this technology, whether it's a DNA virus or an RNA virus, uh, you will definitely learn more about it and be able to sequence it using this technology. There are a few other sequencing technologies that people are using. Um, one of them that's very exciting is something called nanopore sequencing. Uh, and for that one, you also can sequence. And I think we're going to be coming up with some COVID-19 um, uh, episodes uh, and, and, and activities here so we can talk more about that. As for dinosaurs, uh, we don't have any genetic material from dinosaurs to look at. We do, we could obviously study relatives of dinosaurs. Uh, we also are not, I think maybe there was, if not dinosaurs, but definitely some prehistoric animals. Uh, oftentimes, actually, uh, interestingly, we can get protein from those. And I believe there have been examples of protein sequencing uh, where you use something like mass spectrometry from things like cartilage that people have been able to take from things that are not quite fossilized. Uh, so in some way or somehow you can get some information uh, from biological materials uh, for a long time. The other question that I see there is uh, talking about the method of accuracy. 
Um, we will be talking about sequence accuracy uh, as a little bit further on. So I'm gonna save that. And then if you have more questions, come, uh, come, come back with them because accuracy is gonna be important uh, in just a few minutes. Okay, so let's go back and share the slides. We're almost to the end of our time here and we've got to start the lab. Um, let's go here. Okay, so uh, ooh, the very first thing we need to do is create our DNA Subway project. Uh, so we're gonna go on to DNA Subway. If you have an account, great. Um, you'll be able to go with us and, and follow along. If you don't have an account yet, um, then come back to this video once you have an account and you can follow along step by step. And I've also put some instructions uh, in linked. We're gonna cover just this first part of it. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's go ahead and let me switch windows to DNA Subway. Okay. So this is the DNA Subway tool. If you haven't been here before, you can find it at dnasubway.cybers.org. Uh, certainly go ahead and uh, Google it if you couldn't, if you didn't find it that way. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and log in. Okay, and what we're working with is something called the green line, which is the analysis line that is developed for doing an RNA-seq experiment. Um, so there are a couple of things that we need to do in order to get started. I'm gonna take you through them and then we're gonna look at the first part of our experiment. We won't finish the analysis today because some parts of it can take several minutes, uh, but you can go ahead and finish it in time for next week's episode. Uh, the other cool thing about DNA Subway, and it's kind of mentioned here, is that we run these resources on supercomputers. So actually, this experiment in particular makes use of some supercomputing that happens down at the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Take a look at those things, including Stampede, uh, which is one of the fastest computers in the world. All right, so we've got to create a project. And what we're going to do is select here uh, for the data set that we're looking at with these neural stem cells. We're going to select paired end reads. Um, I haven't gone into the sequencing technology to that level of depth, but what happens is when you do the sequencing, you can either choose to do sequencing in one direction only, or you can do in two directions, uh, which makes for what we call paired reads. Um, it's more expensive to do the paired reads, but it gives you a lot more information. So usually you want to do that if you can. So I'm going to go ahead and select paired reads. And then we need to tell it what organism we are working with. So there's a list of things here. And in our case, the data that we're coming from is going to be from humans. So we'll choose Homo sapiens. And then we can give this a title. And this is going to be part one live. And that's all that we need to do to start our project. Um, so it's mentioning that there's some options here, but we can ignore that. And the first thing we need to do is actually bring in the data. Now, actually, I'm not covering it here, but you can use your own data that you've obtained either through your own experiment, uh, if you are fortunate enough to do it, or through from the NCBI SRA. And if we have questions about that, maybe we can work that more into the next episode. Um, but we have data that we've already uploaded for you, but we still need to import it into DNA Subway. So to do that, we click on Manage Data. And then um, it's going to be in this folder called Sample Data. And then here is this folder called Zika Infected uh, HMPC, so Human Neuroprogenitor Stem Cells. So, we have a whole bunch of uh, the sequence reads. They're all a type of file, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, called a FASTQ file. They're also .gz, which means they're compressed. So what I'm going to do is I want them all. I believe there are eight files here. And then we're going to go ahead and click Add Files. And it'll take a moment to add them. And we'll take a look at what these files actually contain um, back in the slides in just a moment. Okay, so we've added all of these files and we can see their size. They're actually pretty big. Uh, you could get bigger than this, but already um, 
we have here, you know, a gig plus of data that we're looking at. So the very first thing we want to do is indicate by turning the pair mode on that uh, if you look, some of them end with an underscore one and underscore two. So these are actually a pair, 542 underscore one, 542 underscore two, so on and so forth. So we want to indicate that these are paired sequences because by pairing them, that will allow the software to know that we have paired end data, okay? And the next thing we need to do is we actually need to run some QC. So if I click on run here, it's going to start an automatic process, which is going to run a piece of software, which I'm going to describe in just a moment. Now, you can only run about four of these jobs at a time. The first thing that happens when you click run is it says it's processing. And then when it's ready, when that processing has started, you can go ahead and click another one. And so on and so forth. Now, this will literally take you several minutes in order to do that. So we're not going to complete it now. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if in a few minutes the first one I've done finishes. So I'm just going to let that run and I'm going to go back to the slide to explain a little bit more about what's happening. Okay. So the first key concept or the concept that we're dealing with at this point is the idea of something called sequence quality. And this is maybe related to some questions we got just a moment ago. So we're going to use a tool, and we're already using a tool called FastQC. Uh, and FastQC is a, is a piece of software that many scientists use, and it allows you to uh, take a look at DNA sequence. And keep in mind that, uh, especially if you watch the previous uh, series, which is on bar barcoding bioinformatics, we were looking at maybe one or two or three or a handful of, of DNA sequences. But when we're doing uh, sequencing for an RNA-seq experiment or for assembling a genome, typically we're looking at millions of sequences or tens of millions of sequences. So we need software that can give us averages of what's actually going on and help us to know whether the quality is good or bad. Now, um, a, a term that you should know if you don't already is how we report on sequence quality. And we typically report on sequence quality using something called a FRED score. And a FRED score is a logarithmic scale. And you could have a score somewhere between, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, actually. I think it goes up to 60. And uh, if you have, let's say, a FRED score of 10, which is not very good, uh, that means there's a 1 in 10 chance that a, any given base is incorrectly called. So that's an accuracy of 90%. Now, 90% usually, you know, might sound good, right? I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't mind uh, getting a 90 on a test. A 95 would be better. 100 would be great, but 90 is not that bad, right? Um, if you have a FRED score of 20, um, your accuracy is 99%, which sounds even better. But when you really think about um, sequence quality, you have to consider that if you're looking at millions of reads or billions of nucleotides of DNA, uh, having a quality that's only 99% means one in 100 is going to be wrong. Well, if you multiply that by a billion, um, then you're going to have a lot of data that's really not usable. So oftentimes we're looking for sequence quality at least 99.9 percent, if not higher, uh, if we can get it. Now the files that are that we get back from the sequencing company look like this. And what is this? Um, hopefully you pick out the string of DNA letters, A, C's, T's, and G's, and that looks reasonable. But there's some other things on this, and this is a file format called FASTQ. And by and large, all sequencing technologies report out uh, sequence data, the high throughput sequencing, or sometimes called next generation sequencing, um, give you this format. And it's a format in which every sequencing read has four lines on it. The first line always begins with an at symbol, and it's usually some information about the sequence. Uh, like the machine that was on, maybe it has some other identifying information, but it's the name of that individual read and it tells you something about it. That's not the most important, but it's important. The next line, line two, is always the DNA sequence, the raw DNA sequence, G's, A's, T's, and C's. The next line, this little plus, could sometimes just be a plus and sometimes have additional information. I've never known it to be super useful, but yet it's in there. 
And the fourth line looks really weird. The fourth line looks like it's somebody has just typed a whole bunch of random buttons on the keyboard, but the fourth line is actually the quality score. It's the FRED score. Now I told you the FRED score is a number, right? Like 30 or 31 or 27. So how is that the FRED score? As it turns out, um, remember how we saw that those files were quite big? Well, it turns out that um, this is a scale. It's a little bit complex to read, but we actually only need to focus on a few lines in it that I circled in red, but let me go back for a second. Okay, if you were to take the numbers, if you focus actually on um, this line right here, the, the middle one that I circled in red, and if you go from zero to one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, you could say this is 26, so they've marked out for some reason, for, but a scale from zero to 41, whatever, you're, whatever you wanna choose. Um, it turns out, if you know a little bit about computing history, there's something called ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, and every symbol on the keyboard, whether it's this uh, exclamation mark or this quotation mark or this pound sign or hashtag sign or dollar sign, they all correspond to a number. And so rather than writing two numbers, which would literally take up more computer memory and saying your score is 23 or 27, we use one of these symbols to uh, come to equivalent to, or to be equivalent to a, um, a FRED score. So for example, if you go back and you see an exclamation mark, that corresponds to quality score of zero. So that G that you see here, even though it says G, is probably basically unbelievable. You can't really believe it. Um, if you see these, there's two little quote marks. So quote marks are up here, and we could imagine that those are also pretty low scores. But when you get to sort of like uppercase, some, when you get to some numbers, that's a little bit better. Uh, and when you get to some uppercase letters, well, those are pretty good quality, right? Um, so if we see, okay, there's some C's over here, but those are probably good quality, okay? Um, the key takeaway from the message is just a code. Uh, but we really want to look at the, the sequence. So before I come back to this slide, let's take a look and see. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if our first one is done here, what that looks like. Okay, so I just ran two of them. Uh, let's take a look at the first one. Okay, so what you come back with is this thing called a Fred, uh, a fast QC report. The very first thing the report tells you is, um, you know, what the file name is, uh, tells you the encoding, which is that more complicated graph. How many bases do we have? So one, two, three, one, two, three, seven point nine million bases. And um, if we look, we get this nice graph. And let me zoom out just a little bit. What we're telling um, is from left to right. Well, I can zoom in here. From left to right on this first graph is the position in the base pair. So this is nucleotide one, two, three, four, five, so on and so forth, all the way up to 76 nucleotides. And then on the y-axis is the FRED score. So if you were a FRED score of zero to 20, we'd be in the red zone. Uh, 20 to 28, we're in the yellow zone. And now most of our sequence data is in the green zone where it's got really, really pretty high FRED scores. Um, if you're familiar with a box plot or box, box and whisker, this is giving us some interquartile ranges, but the blue line is the median. So what it's trying to say is that over 70 million, or how many, 7, 7 million, if I had the number right, uh, 7.9 million, 8 million nucleotides that it looked through, on average, the quality is somewhere around here, like a 37, and maybe it dips off slightly. So this one, this per base sequence quality is telling you that it's uh, what the quality is. And if I go back to my slides for a second, I'll come back to this in a moment, but just to sort of work our way through, um, here are two examples of good data versus bad data. So what typically happens, although even now nowadays in Illumina sequencing, it's pretty good. Um, what typically happens is that the sequence at the beginning is, is pretty okay, but as you get longer and longer, um, the sequence quality degrades. And thanks to improvements in technology, that's not so much the case, but could still happen. Um, generally what we see and what we'd like to see is something like a graph on the right, where there's some variation in sequence quality, but by and large across the whole thing, it looks pretty good. 
Uh, let's take a look at the other reports and we'll come back to the slides and then finish up what we need to do. And there's a little bit of homework if you want to be set for the next uh, section. Um, there are some other graphs here, so you can skip down uh, per sequence. Um, so let me zoom out. So the area under the curve here is telling us if you average the FRED score for the entire read, so every nucleotide, uh, we have very few, if any, um, that have an average score down here. But as you get into 30s, you have more area under the curve. And when you get to 36 or 37, so the large majority of our reads are really, really high quality. So this is fantastic data to use. There are a couple of other things, other reports that you could look at. Um, there are some biases that one could expect or not in the amount of uh, nucleotides uh, composition or the GC content. I typically don't care so much about these other um, these other things. Um, there is some sequence duplication, which is from the fact that we're doing an RNA-seq experiment. But really for our level of understanding, uh, the first two graphs are the most important. And in fact, if I go back to my slides for a second, um, you could see in bad data, you might have a large area under the curve for some of those lower quality values. Okay, um, so, that, those are the two ones that I really want to focus on for our level of understanding. Um, what I think we want to do uh, is there is a question uh, I see in the chat on their F score. You mean the FRED score, P-H-R-E-D. And the FRED score is just this scale that we use on quality which is if you have a FRED score of 10, this is this, the, we get the FRED score from the computer that does the sequencing. It assigns a call, a number to every single base that it calls. And that number is based on the strength of the signal that it's reading. In our case, for example, the color of one of those dots. If the strength is not very strong, if the signal is not very bright, then it might give it a score of 10, which means there's a one in 10 chance that that is a that that it's calling it, but it's mistaken. Uh, if you have a higher FRED score, um, like a 30, that means there's only a one in 1,000 chance that that is a mistake. Uh, so we believe in a FRED score uh, when it's up in the 30s range. So there's one more thing that we need to do. I'm going to go back to DNA Subway, and this is what we're going to end for today. Well, two more things that you need to do if you're following along. Number one is that. Uh, in order to be ready for the next episode, you want to go ahead and do QC on all of these. So you can go ahead and click run on all of these and then come back to it. The next thing, the next step that you can do is there is the next step in on DNA Subway called the FastX Toolkit. And what you could do uh, is go ahead and click on just the basic column runs. And when you run this, what's going to happen is there's going to be an attempt to uh, clean up even those nucleotides that are of lower quality. Now, because our data looks so good, you could actually skip the FASTX toolkit. But in the next episode, I'll talk to you a little bit about what it does and how it works. Um, and if you wanna try running it, you can run it um, for all of the samples. Use the basic, not the advanced. And we'll come back next time and explain a little bit about that. And then also go into the next episode, which is going to be about uh, doing the alignments. Because, let me go back to the last slide here. Uh, once you have uh, taken a look at the sequence quality, we're going to align those sequences to the reference genome, which is the first uh, step, or refer reference transcriptome, give the spoiler, which is the first step to actually counting them and then determining what the abundance is. So I'm looking in the chat and I don't see any further questions. Going to give it um, just a few seconds. But uh, if you do come up with questions, you can go ahead and leave them in the comments to this video. And then in the next episode, uh, we'll cover the next few steps, which is, like I said, going to be the alignment. So hopefully you've learned a little bit today. Uh, go to our DNALC Live homepage and look for this episode there, and you'll find some resource sheets with some other uh, links and URLs that you want to look at to get some more background information. So with that said, 
uh, thanks. I hope to see you next week. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Uh, and we'll see you in episode two, part two.